Oh, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, the talk for tonight is about ASP.NET Core beyond the introduction, because uh, I kind of got fed up with ASP.NET Core talks all being about this is the way you get started, this is the way that you build an, an MVC controller, this is the way that you do all of the basic things. Um, so I decided to write the talk about when you go beyond that. You do. I, I've picked up some some things that I've learned along the way and decided that these could be interesting to see. So. Some of it you might have seen before. Um, if you stick around to the end, I can pretty much guarantee that you have not seen what I'm doing in the last demo. So I, that's kind of a cliffhanger. Please stick around. Um, let's see if I can. There it is. So my name is Chris Klug. Um, I work at a company called Active Solution in Stockholm, uh, where I have a really weird situation where I work as a senior consultant doing actual development, but I also spend about 20% of my time uh, doing other stuff, like speaking at conferences, uh, speaking at user groups, uh, writing blog posts, and, and basically sharing knowledge, because we're all about basically sharing as much knowledge as we can from what we learn from different projects and things like that. So that's where my stuff comes out of. Um, Next slide is just uh, time for demos. I'm, I'm just going to go with demos. And I'm just going to say, because I did see that there was a slide about code of conduct. If you do feel offended by anything I say today, uh, I am really sorry. I'm going to blame that I am from Sweden. And I do try to offend everybody equally much. So if you feel sort of like you're singled out, please let me know. And I'll find a way to offend other people as well. Other than that, let's just jump straight into code. So I'm going to close PowerPoint. Bring up Visual Studio. Uh, oh, this is gonna be interesting. Can I can I get this thing to disappear so I don't? Okay, I can at least move it. Uh, there it is. Uh, so I have this. Can I can I hide Zoom in any way? Because uh, it's sort of in my way, blocking that one. I can I can hide. Okay, uh, let's get that out of the way. So uh, I've got this very simple uh, web application. Actually, I got two that I'm going to show you uh, throughout the talk. Uh, and the first one is is really really basic. It's it looks like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a basic website um, where you can go and you can look at information about some fantastic women of, of, of IT throughout the, the ages. And that is fairly uninteresting as such. What is interesting, what annoys me about a website like this is something I see a lot, and that's the, uh, the address up here. So slash user slash one is not the most beautiful address to, for Hedy Lamar and slash user slash two is not a great one for, for Grace Hopper. So what if I want to fix that? And, and I want to show you the flexibility of building uh, what's called middlewares. So if we open up the startup project or startup file, sorry. And yes, in modern versions of ASP.NET Core, you don't have a program.cs and a startup.cs. They are combined into one, but that doesn't make a difference in what I'm going to be showing you tonight. You can do it in both versions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here to, to my configure method, and I'm going to add. So this configure method has dependency injection, so I'm going to have it dependency inject to my iUsers implementation, which is just a, a, a stupid repo with, with users inside of it. And then somewhere around here-ish, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add this piece of code. There it is. Um, so this is what's called a middleware. And as I said, some of you might have seen this before. Uh, middlewares are pieces of code that execute as part of the request pipeline. And you build up your request pipeline in the configure method, and they, they run in order, right? So it's going to go in here, and it's going to potentially do the developer exception page, and then it's going to do the static files one, and then it's going to do my mine, and then it's going to do routing, and then it's going to do endpoints, and then it's inside the endpoints, it's going to do map controllers with MVC. But the cool thing is I can, I can actually short circuit the whole pipeline by going in here and saying, hey, I want to use my own middleware, and here's the code for it. And it's going to take a context, which is the HTTP context and a reference to the new middleware, which is going to be the use routing one. And in here, all I do is I, I look at the path and then I take, so the context.request is basically HTTP context.request.path, which gives me the path that was requested. I verify that it's longer than the one character. And I verify that there is no slash, more than one slash in there. Uh, and then if that is the case, somebody has gone to, my website slash blah. Uh, and if that is the case, if there's only one segment in the path, I go to my users repo and I find any user with the name 
that corresponds to the path, re removing the, the slash at the beginning and replacing any dash with a space instead. So that gray slash grace dash hopper becomes grace space hopper. And if I find a user, the cool thing here is the request of the request property here, or the HTTP request uh, object, is read write. So most of the things on HTTP context in modern ASP.NET is read write compared to being read only in previous versions. And that means that I can actually rewrite the path. So I changed the path from being whatever it was before into slash users slash and then the ID of the user that I found with my name. And then I call next. And then that means that the rest of the pipeline continues to run, which means that it's going to see slash users slash ID, and it's going to end up in MVC. It's going to return the slash users slash one, for example. It's going to return the response for that. And then when it comes back out again after the next, so down here, after the rest of the request pipeline has executed, it's going to go and set the request path back to what it was before I changed it so that any, any um, middleware before my middleware gets the original path that was used. And if I run this, this is actually kind of, I, I think this is kind of cool. It, it means that I can go back out here and I can go to slash grace dash hopper and I get grace hopper. So I didn't have to change the MVC paths. I didn't have to change a bunch of things. All I needed to do was change the way that my middleware replaces the, the path on the way in and then the rest of the system can work like it did before. So that's kind of cool. And I, I really like that idea. Uh, but I kind of dislike the way that this looks. So we can move that into a, a nicer version. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new folder here. And I'm going to name the folder middlewares. Like that. And inside my middlewares folder, I'm going to add a new class. And I'm going to call the class, if my computer could get it, there is name, routing in middleware because that's what it is. It's a name routing middleware. And inside my name routing middleware, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add this piece of code here. And this is a basic middleware. Uh, a middleware doesn't need to implement any interface. It doesn't need to inherit from a base class. It is a pure, plain old C-sharp object. The only difference or the only requirement or requirements in plural is it needs to have a constructor that accepts a request delegate, which is going to be the reference to the new, the next middleware. So in, in this version here, I got like a, a, a function that I could call, uh, which is the next middleware that gets injected into the, the uh, constructor instead. And then I need an async, invoke async method that takes an HTTP context and returns a task. Then I can take this code here. I can pull that out, all of this, control X. I don't, there it is. And I can go in here and we can paste that in there. And I just need to replace that. And then it's going to complain and say, I don't know what users is. Well, dependency injection is fine in here as well. So I'm going to do I users. And I'm going to add a field called users. So this code now is just moved from this in here. So instead of having multiple lines and massive amount of code in your, the, your startup.cs because you have a bunch of middlewares, you can now go and say app.use middleware, and you can tell it to use the name routing middleware like that. There it is. And it will still work. I'm not going to go show you that it works, but it, it, it works in exactly the same way. And this looks a lot nicer than it did before, right? However, it still is not as nice as use static file or use routing or use endpoints. And once again, we can fix that. So I'm just going to go here and I'm going to say add class. Uh, and I'm going to call it middleware extensions. And I'm going to make that a public static class. And then I'm going to add a an extension method called use name routing that extends i application builder and inside there i've just moved this use app use middleware call that i had in my startup cs class and and here is where um, my opinion and some other people's opinion and apparently the asp.net core team's opinion 
deviates because um, they've changed their opinion on how to do this. But I recommend doing it like this. Instead of saying, hey, I want to do using a Microsoft ASP.NET Core Builder as a using statement, I tend to go in here and change my namespace in here to Microsoft ASP.NET Core Builder, like that. And then I add a using statement to my middleware instead. The new recommendation is not to do this. Uh, I want to mention that. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you start pulling in lots of NuGet packages and they all put their extension, the I application builder extension methods in th this namespace here, it means that when you go to startup.cs and you press app and you do dot, you're going to get a gazillion methods in here. Because startup.cs will always have a using statement for Microsoft ASP Network Builder. I personally prefer having it like that so that I can easily see that there's something called name wrapping like that so that I don't have to know what using statement to add before I can start using the extension method. Or I would have to know that there is one called use name routing. I need to write that and then go and control dot and say use add using statements and so on. But this is kind of nice, right? So we got use name routing like that. We can remove the, uh, actually, I'm going to use this later on. So let's do that. So nice middlewares are awesome. They allow you to plug into uh, to the request pip pipeline in a very low level, uh, which can be really powerful. For example, I, I asked myself, how do you implement this developer exception page? Because uh, that seems really complicated because it needs to catch exceptions further down the line in stuff that I haven't written. How do you do that? Well, actually, the implementation of that is really, really simple. It just does a using statement. It does it, sorry, it does a try catch statement around a wait next. And in the catch, it goes and shows you the, uh, the exception page. Because every one of these methods will call the next one and the next one and the next one. So it basically becomes this Russian doll of calls. So if you start doing a try catch around the call to the next middleware, you will do a try catch around the entire rest of the middleware pipeline that you're currently executing. That's kind of nice. Uh, there's still one bug in this code, though. It's not a bug. It's, 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 it's a feature, as we call it. But there is this annoying thing that, oops, I need to restart my server, uh, restart that. We go back out here, we go back. Uh, if we look at this thing here, if we look down in the left-hand corner, it, it, the URL for this link here still is slash user slash one, and this has slash user slash two. So yes, even though I can go in here and write slash Hedy Lamar, and that works, any link on my website is still going to be incorrect, right? And here is where we can go middlewares again. Um, we can go in here and we can say, let's do something like this. So I'm putting in another middleware here, and I'm going to add a user statement for system.io. So what I'm doing is another little hacky thing. And OK, before I write this, I want to mention one thing. Never, ever, ever do what I'm doing right now. Uh, there's a massive performance penalty of what I am doing. Uh, I am showing it as a, an example of how flexible the pipeline is, and, and you can do really cool things with it. But yes, what I'm doing right now, there is a massive performance penalty. I want to mention that. After that caveat, let's come back to, or warning, let's go back to, to what I'm doing. I mentioned that the request ob um, object was, or HP request was read-write. The HTTP response is actually read-write as well in most properties. And one of the properties it has is body. So body is a stream. And when you write to the stream, it gets sent to the client in the default implementation. So somewhere down here in the ASP.NET controller, it does response.write, and it writes out to the, to the response of body. What I'm doing here is I actually take the, that stream, and I store that in a variable. Then I replace the implementation of body with a memory stream. Then I call the next pipeline, rest of the pipeline, and let it execute. So the rest of the pipeline runs through and thinks that it's re rendering information back to the client, while in the actual world, it's rendering it to my memory stream. And then when I get down here, I just write out. So I, I go ahead and I take the old stream, and I write my memory stream contents to the original stream. OK, that's one thing. But what if we take this thing here 
and we replace that with this. Uh, once again, massive performance caveat, please do not do this. I am showing you this as a demonstration of how you can tweak the pipeline to do what you need. There are massive problems with this code. I am just want to make that very clear. And if anybody goes on Twitter and says, zero call is showing you us really, really crappy code, he sucks. I want to make sure that you've understood that this is a bad idea, but it's still kind of cool. So what it does, it takes to my memory stream, turns it into an array and turns it into a, a, a string. Then I do a regular expression to find if there's any string, any match inside that string of slash users slash and one or more digits. And if there is, it means that there is a URL in there that points to slash user slash one, two, whatever. And then I go ahead and I pull out all of my users from my, my uh, database uh, or whatever storage I have. In my case, it's stored in a JSON file. And then it basically goes through and does a for each over each one of the people in my system and replacing any slash user slash ID with a, a proper URL that I want to use instead. And then I take my string and I turn it into bytes again. And then I write my byte stream to the, uh, the response. And if there is no link in there, I'm just returning the string as such. If I run this now, nope, that was the wrong button. That's the what I want. If I run this now and I refresh this page, if you look down here, why did that not start? Control F5, there it is, okay. If we run this now, you can now see that the links go to slash head lamar. And this thing goes to slash brace hopper. So the cool thing here is that I can actually go in and make changes to the response object to a point where I can actually cache the outgoing string, a stream of information. And when it comes back after the rest of the pipeline, I can modify the response back to the client. As I said, massive performance issues as such, but there are scenarios where this technique is actually quite cool and quite useful, and you can do this in a more optimized way. But I want to show you sort of the idea behind it. But looking at it, I went like, well, that's really crap performance, so I can fix that. I can make that better. Uh, so I can do that better in a very simple and, and kind of stupid way by going in and asking for an I distributed cache. So an iDistributed cache uh, is an interface that's available in every ASP.NET Core application. It gets registered by default when you start ASP.NET Core, and the default implementation of the distributed cache is a non-distributed cache. It's an in-memory cache. So you ask for a distributed one, but you get an in-memory one. But it's very, very easy for you to replace the iDistributed cache implementation with SQL uh, or Redis or something else that's out of state or out of um, memory which then would make it a distributed cache. But it's, it's possible to pull that in even in a, in a single environment back on my laptop, that works fine. Um, and then I'm gonna go in uh, sort of here. I'm gonna go and add a bit of code. So I'm adding another middleware. As you can see, I love my middlewares. So I'm creating another middleware in here. And what I do in here is I ask my cache to see is there an item in the cache that corresponds to the current path? And if there is, then I return that back. So basically, if, if the value is cached, then uh, return that. Otherwise, let the rest of the pipeline run. And once the rest of the pipeline has run, look at the um, items of the HTTP context and see if there's a value called add to cache. Uh, and if there is, that value is going to be a byte array. Uh, and then I go and I set the cache to that byte array with the key being the path. And I say, hey, put an absolute expiration relative to now for 10 minutes. So basically cache whatever value you find there for 10 minutes, which means that I can go down here to write a sync statement and say ctx dot items add, whoops, that didn't turn out very well, uh, add to cache equals bytes like that. And if I put a breakpoint in here now, uh, somewhere around, sort of, yeah, we can have it there. Uh, I go F5, so we can debug this. Come on, there it is. It goes in here, I come to the first page in here, 
uh, it's going to go and break in here. 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 Um, and you can see it comes in here and it goes through the code here and it, it, it does the replacement and everything. If I just F5 that, come back out here, everything looks good. I do another refresh. It's not going to break into my code because it actually gets caught up here and it finds that result in the database or in my cache. So you can see here that it uses the cached value instead. Um, once again, don't use this caching code. There's much better caching implementations out there because what this is going to do is over time, it's just going to create this massive caching thing that caches every single page more or less, which is kind of annoying. But it, it works and it shows you all of it. It, it should show you your sort of like how much you can tweak and build advanced features by going lower level into your uh, request pipeline than you, you normally would. Um, Oh yeah, and also want to mention, you're, if you have any questions, just unmute and ask them and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Um, I know I'm pretty intense and I, I speak fast and I, I speak a lot. And if you're waiting for me to shut up for you to be able to ask any questions, not going to happen. Uh, so just unmute, unmute and ask any questions that you have. Um, okay, so uh, my, my web application here now, if we go back to that, uh, is is obviously a modern web app. You can you can you can just see from the amount of really cool design work that I've done that this is a modern web application. And any modern web application obviously has an API, right? So I'm going to pull out Insomnia here, um, and it, it has an API uh, that I can use. And for some reason, my machine is ridiculously slow. Um, so here you can see it, it requests that address by my 44302, which is that 44302, my website. Uh, and it goes slash API slash user slash one. And if I send that, I get a response with Hedy Lamar and the information about Hedy Lamar. So that's fine. And I like HTTP, right? And I like REST. And one of the things with REST and HTTP and the HTTP standard and everything is that we can go in and we can use this header called accept header. And, and I can just add this accept header and say, hey, I don't want to have JSON. I want that cool old style funky XML stuff that everybody wants to have. Uh, so I'm just going to go and say, I'm going to accept text XML. And I send that and, and I, get, I get JSON back anyway. And the reason for this is that there is support for this built into ASP.NET Core. And in older versions of, of MVC, uh, the text XML um, stuff was enabled by default. It's not in ASP.NET Core, but we can easily go back to our website, uh, we, our, our code, and we can go to start up here. And then uh, somewhere around sort of here, uh, we can go and say options like that. And we say options dot uh, output formatters dot add like that. And then we go new XML serializer output formatter like that. That didn't come out right. Hello. There it is. Uh, like that. Rebuild the application. Uh, and if I go back to this thing here and I go send again, it's going to load. And now you can see it comes back to this in XML. So that now allows me to switch between JSON and XML in a nice way. So if you have clients that need XML, you can provide XML. If you want JSON, you can have that. That works fine. There's no code changes. It is still going to be the same controller. So if I go into the user's controller here, you can see it's just a standard user. It returns an action result of user. And then the formatter does the formatting between JSON and XML, and it, it knows how to use the exact header like that. So that's kind of cool. I really like that. Uh, what, what I like even more is the fact that we can use the accept header for a lot of things, right? One thing would be that I could go and say, I also accept uh, HTML, the text HTML. And then my API endpoint could not only return JSON XML, it could also return a web page showing the information. Or I could say, I want to go to slash API slash user slash one, and I want to do an image and then my API could return an image. So the same URL can be turned into returning a bunch of different things dependent on what you pass in as the accept header. The problem with this in ASP.NET Core is that you can't actually do that out of the box. So for example, uh, say that I want to do JSON initially, 
but I, I, I want to have a shorter version of this. I don't want to pull down the bio and everything every single time I have a, a user that I want to view. I want to have a shorter, short version of a user. So I decided that I'm going to use this accept header called application slash vnd.user. And this is sort of a, it's a quite a kind of a standard thing. It's not documented as such. You, you can do whatever header you want. The accept header can be any string you want. But generally you say application slash means that it's application specific. VND says that it's specific to this application and it's defined by the vendor who built the system. And user is the kind of object that I want to back, want back. So if I want to go to user slash one and I want to get a user back, I can add that. And if I send that in, nothing is going to change. It's just going to look the same. So imagine that I want to shorten this down. I'm going to go and to my API here and I'm going to add a new folder in here. I'm going to call it models. And in my models folder, I'm going to add a new class. I'm going to call it basic, basic user like that. And I'm going to implement that really, really quickly like that. Uh, I keep saying this at every single conference I do. Never, ever take a contract for a client where you don't have pre-built snippets. It just takes too long to code it all. Uh, so always have snippets around. And I have a snippet here for basic user. So the basic user just takes a user object and it removes two of the fields, like the image field and the bio, and just exposes the ID, first name, and last name. So that's, that's all it really does. Then in my user controller here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add another endpoint here that looks like this. It's going to return an I action result of basic user. Uh, and it takes a user ID. And it does the same thing as the previous action. The only difference is that at the end here, I say basic user.create. And I pass in my user to scrub most of those extra fields that I don't need or extra properties. Now, the astute watcher of this is going to look at this and say, well, with two HTTP gets, Chris, it's going to fail. And uh, honestly, the user would be completely correct, or the viewer, because this is going to fail. If I run this, it's going to complain and say that there are multiple actions that can that correspond to the endpoint that I'm trying to reach, and that's not allowed, and it fails. So to fix that, to make this possible to, to work the way that I want it to be able to do, so I want to be able to get a basic user if I pass in one header, and I want to get a user if I pass in another, don't pass in a header. Uh, to do that, I need to go and, and, and create some stuff. So to solve that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create another folder in here. Add new folder. It's going to be called infrastructure, like that. I also want to mention that if you start adding folders called infrastructure, utils, uh, and things like that, uh, you should probably take a hard look at what the code is actually doing because normally it should be sort of corresponding to what it does. But infrastructure is going to work for me right now. And I'm going to add something called accept header, accept header attribute, like that. And the accept header attribute looks like this. So it's a class called accept header attribute. It inherits from attributes, so I can use it as an attribute. Uh, it implements I action constraint. So I action constraint is an interface from ASP.NET Core. Uh, it requires you to implement one method and one property. You need to implement accept. And the accept method is called every time you try to reach an action. And if the accept header return or accept method returns true, then yes, this, this method here is val valid for the current request. And if it returns false, it says, no, this action is not valid for the current request. So you get the, the context of the current request, and then you return true or false whether or not the action can be in, uh, invoked. And then finally, there's a, an order field that you can use to get your attributes run in specific orders and everything. And I'm just going to ignore that and leave that as zero. So in my case, what I want to do is I'm going to look at the HTTP context. And I'm going to look at the request headers and say, is there an accept header in here that starts with whatever I've passed into my constructor? All I need. Save that. Go back out here and add accept header like that. And it asks me for what accept header I want to use. Well, application slash vnd.user, like that. 
It's all I need to do. Rebuild this project. And I go back to Insomnia. And I send this. And you will see that it doesn't start because I have to go control F5 for some reason, not just build. If I run this again, I now have a short version. I have a small version. I have a long version. And I can change it based on the header that I'm passing in, which is really awesome. And it means that you can also use it for versioning, for example. So if you don't pass in a specific header, you get a default version. Otherwise, you get the version you specified. So over time, your API can evolve. Your endpoints can be modified in a changing change in a way that breaks backwards compatibility. But you require somebody to pass in a specific accept header. And versioning is implemented like that. And you can have all these different endpoints or actions responding to the different endpoints or right, different requests. Um, another thing that I like is I, I just show you the, the XML. And I do know that everybody hates XML today. But let's just leave it and say that I need XML and JSON. And what you normally do here is that there's a convention that you add the application slash vnd.user as this is the type that I want to get. And then you add plus an XML to say that I want it in XML format. And then there's a plus JSON saying that I want to have it in JSON format. If I run this now, it's not going to work because it has no idea that I'm actually asking for XML because the way that ASP.NET Core figures out that it wants XML is that you have to pass in this thing here. So you have to pass in text XML. And if you need pass in text XML, you're, going to, you're not going to get this version of the user. This is a little bit more complicated to fix, still very fixable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to add another class in here. It's going to be called accept header output formatter selector. So the output formatter that we added before, the XML serializer output formatter, an output formatter is responsible for taking an object and formatting it for the current output. So there's an XML version and there's a JSON version. And the a, a output formatter selector is the thing that is responsible for selecting what output formatter to use. And the built-in one uh, doesn't do a whole lot use. It doesn't help you with this specific case. So I'm going to go and create my own. And it's going to look like this. It's going to be accept header output formatter selector. It's going to implement out or inherit from out output formatter selector. And to be able to do that, I need to override the select formatter that takes a context, some formatters, and a media type collection, and it returns an I output formatter. So all I need to implement is that. And the way that I'm going to implement it is I'm going to go ahead and create a constructor, first of all. And in the constructor, I'm going to request the I options of MVC options. And if you wonder what that means, what this property, this passed in parameter is going to be, it is actually going to be that options that we have here. So whatever you configure here, together with the default values on that object, is going to be injected into my, my service here, or into my output formatter selector. And then I need an iLogger factory. And then based on those two inputs, I'm going to go ahead and create a fallback selector, which is basically saying, if I can't handle this selection, then I'm going to fall back to the default one that ASP.NET Core has built in. So I'm creating one of those. And then I'm going to create a list of format output formatters available in the options uh, that gets passed in. So I'm going to get my XML serializer output formatter and the JSON one that's in there by default as well. And I store those into variables here. And then I have a dictionary here where it basically maps JSON to the proper MIME type, applications like JSON. And it, it maps XML to the proper XML MIME type, which is text slash XML. Inside my select formatter, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go and add this piece of code here, first of all. And as you can see, my first row here is it looks at the HTTP context, looks at the, accept, the headers, looks at the accept header, say, checks to see, does, is there an accept header that starts with application V and D dot? This should probably be any uh, instead of first, because you can actually pass in multiple accept headers. But to keep it simple, I'm just taking the first one, checking to see, does the accept header start with application slash vnd dot? 
if it doesn't start with application VND, then I really don't care because then it's a default formatter. And then I'm just going to return whatever the fallback, the default ASP.NET Core implementation decides to use for that. If it does include one of those headers, I'm going to go and check the formatters that gets passed in. And then if that is empty, I'm going to default to the ones that I have got passed into the constructor. Then I'm going to change the content type of my context to something I get out of my, a method here. And then I'm going to ask my formatter saying, hey, can you go ahead and format this thing here? Because every one of these formatters has a method called can write result. And then you go, hey, can you write the result for this request? And then afterwards, I return back to the original content type. And I return the formatter that decided that, hey, I can format it. And there is a default formatter in there that will format anything, basically. Uh, which is not really what we want, but it is there. So you can always assume that this is going to return true or return a, a formatter. So this get content type from accept header is actually pretty stupid. Uh, all it really does is, once again, it looks at the he accept header. It likes to see if there is a, a plus sign in there. If there is a plus sign, I split the accept header at the plus sign, and I take whatever is on the right-hand side of that, which is going to be JSON or XML, and I ask my content type map, this dictionary up here, to turn it into the correct MIME type, and I return that. And if there's no plus sign, I'm going to go ahead and use whatever is used for JSON. So what happens here is that it comes in here as application slash vnd.user plus XML. I replace the content type with text XML. Then I ask the formatter, hey, do you know how to format text XML? I get my formatter. And then I reset it back to the application vnd.users plus XML for it to work. So that, that anything else basically gets the original header. So I have this output formatter selector. What I can do now is I can go back out here and I can say services dot add singleton. And I'm going to add an output, output formatter selector. That didn't come out right, something like that. And my implementation is going to be the accept header output formatter selector, like that. I spelled that wrong, but that's good enough. So that's actually just what I'm doing here is that add MVC controllers with views will add an implementation of output formatter selector. But what I'm doing is I'm overriding it with my implementation to replace whatever I, the ASP.NET team gave us out of the box. If I run this now, I run this now, let's go back out here, and I send that. I now get my basic user in XML format with my basic information. And if I remove it and I do the plus JSON and run that, I get the basic version in JSON. And if I run it, with just that, I get my complex version, and that's kind of cool. So now we've got this cool accept header controlling what we're returning back. And as I said, I could also go in here and, and create another endpoint where if you passed in image slash JPEG as the accept header, I would have the same URL, but instead I would get a picture of the person instead of the text. So REST is awesome, HTTP is awesome, and if you learn how to use it, you can do really cool things with a bit of tweaking in ASP.NET Core. So there's one more thing I really dislike, no, no, not really, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but there's one thing I kind of dislike about this um, ASP.NET controller here. Every single developer gets unfortunately told that Dry is the most important thing. We should not repeat ourselves. Do not repeat yourself is like the mantra from everyone, basically. I'm kind of veering away from that um, the more I learn about coding and the more I see problems that it causes. But for this, imagine that I didn't get a user ID here and had to go and pull out my user and then verify if it's null and return blah, 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 because I need to do that in here and I need to do it there and I need to do it here and I need to do it there. And also, I need to make everything async because of that. Imagine that I could go and say user like that instead, which means that I could remove that call. And since it's now not asynchronous anymore, I can remove that and I can remove that. And all of a sudden, my methods are much, much cleaner. 
we could even shorten this down to a, a nice little sort of um, single line return, but I'm just going to leave it like this. And then I could do the same thing down here. We could do user like that. We could remove the task and they sync. We could clean that out. We could remove that. As you can see, it actually looks pretty nice now. Um, it, it's, it's a lot cleaner. And I don't need to pass that in anymore because I don't know the, need the user's endpoint anymore. So um, why, why wouldn't I do this? Well, or rather, how can I do this? Well, there's something called a model binder in ASP.NET Core. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go, in, go into uh, this thing here. I'm going to go and say add new class. And I'm going to add a, a, a thing called a user model bi binder like that. And I'm going to replace that with my snippet here. Uh, as you can see, a model binder is a class that implements iModelBinder. It supports dependency injection without a problem. And the iModelBinder has a single method you need to implement, which is bind model async. It gets a model binding context with the information about the model binding that's going to happen. And it returns a task. And inside this thing here, I'm going to go ahead and write a little bit of code. So the first thing I do is I check to see if the binding context is null. If it is, I throw an, an exception. That's just defensive programming, not required as such. And then here, the binding context has this thing called model metadata.name. So this gets you the name of the parameter or property that you're trying to bind at the moment. So when I go binding context.model metadata.name, what I'm going to get is the name of this parameter. So it's actually going to be the string user, just, just that user like that. So I'm going to take that user, and I'm going to concatenate that with ID, or I'm going to append ID at the end. So I get this key called user ID. And then I'm going to ask the value provider, say, did anybody at the other end, did the client who sent this request pass along a user ID value? And it, it, when we do binding context value provider get value and we pass in user ID here, it's going to look for query string parameters. It's going to look for uh, form fields and things like that. So we do that and it says, no, well, if you didn't find any user ID, then I'm just going to return because I have no idea how to bind that. That's not my problem. Go and ask someone else. If it does find a, a user ID value being passed from the client, I'm going to go and pull out the value of that. So first I ask, is there one? If there is, then can I get the first value? Then I get the value that the client sent in, and I try to parse that as an integer. And if I can't parse this as an integer, I add a model state error saying that, hey, you did something wrong. The user ID must be a number. If, I do know, if, it, if it can be parsed as an integer, then I'm going to ask my user's uh, repository, do you have a user with this ID? And I'm going to pull that out. And then I'm going to say the result of this call here is a success. I managed to do the binding for you. And here is the thing that I found for you that should be passed in for that value. So this is a bi bind model binder that basically it looks for a user ID and it returns a user if needed. And you would kind of believe that that was it. Uh, I could now go in and start using that. And it's actually not quite that simple. It needs a supporting class called a mod model binder provider. So I'm going to do a user model binder provider, which is literally that. It, it's supposed to provide a model binder to use. So if we do this, it implements iModelBinder provider. It has a single method called getBinder. It gets a specific context, the current binding context, and it returns a model binder. And as you can see, all I do is I check to see if I pass the context properly. If, if that's not the case, I throw an exception. And then I look at the binding type. Are you trying to bind to a user? If that is the case, then I'm going to go ahead and return a user model binder. But I can't actually return the user model binder because I need to do dependency injection. And the way that we manage to do dependency injection is by wrapping the type of model binder is an, in another model binder called binder type model binder that makes sure to implement iModelBinder with dependency injection enabled. 
Uh, and if it's if I'm not trying to bind to a, a user, then hey, I don't know what he I don't know what binder to use, and I'm going to return null. So that's kind of neat. I got my user model binder provider. I got my user model binder. So what we can do now is we can open up the startup CS. Can go in here to this thing here and say options dot model binder providers, and do not use add, because if you do add in here, it's going to end up at the end of the list. And there is a default model binder provider in that list that will say, yes, I know how to do it for everything. So what you want to do is an, is an insert. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to insert a, a zero to put it at the start. And then you user mod, model binder provider like that. So now I'm telling ASP.NET Core how to get the model binder. And if we go back to this thing here and we put in a breakpoint there and a breakpoint there, because I don't know which one I'm going to run. And then we run this code here. Actually, we run it with F5 for debugging, obviously. And then we go back to Insomnia. And I send the request to it. It's going to go back in. It's going to go back in there. And as you can see, I get in here. And the user has actually been populated with a proper user and I just need to verify if it's null, then I return not found. Otherwise, I return OK, and everything is fine. Uh, and if I go and I pass in uh, 12, which doesn't exist, we can run that again. It's going to pop in here. It's going to be null. So it's going to it's going to basically fail the, the, the model binding because there's no user 12. And if I go and add ABC, and I run that, it's not even going to reach my endpoint because it's going to have a validation error, which I added in my model binder saying that, hey, user ID must be a number. So that's kind of neat. Uh, I'm just going to replace that back to that. And as you can see, we end up in here. Uh, we end up in the, there it is. So model binding is kind of cool as well. It gives us this ability. Generally, they say with one of, another one of these massive CRISP caveats, you shouldn't really run off to the database in your model binder because there are some inherent problems with that and it slows down your system. But you can imagine being able to take multiple inputs from a form or something like that and combining those into a, a whole object in a nicer way or in a custom way that you need or whatever you need to, to make it work. So that's kind of nice. I, I like model binding as well, um, kind of a cool feature. And I also have this other project uh, called Enterprise Employee Management Inc. And I'm going to set that as my startup project. Let's start the project. Uh, and I'm going to browse to it, which is down there. And as you can see, it's another one of my fantastically designed websites. So I'm going to log in as a Grace. And I think the password is password. Yep. So you get in here, and what we can do at our awesome source company is that we can add profile pictures to our employees. So we've got John Doe here. He doesn't have a profile picture. I want to be able to go in and add a profile picture. The problem with profile pictures is that they, they sometimes are a little bit big. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we resize them and, and make sure that they fit the right size and they're not too big and all of that. And that can be a pretty heavy task to do. So. I don't want to do that when I press upload because it could take some time and I could overload the server with, with requests and it could get, slow down the system with a pretty unimportant feature. So I want to do that as a background task. And, and once you start talking about background tasks, a lot of people start calling out a bunch of different uh, frameworks that you can use for it, um, like Hangfire, for example. A lot of these things can actually be implemented in a much, much nicer, not nicer, but simpler way. So what we can do is we can add a folder in here. We can call it, uh, let's call it infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I am Swedish, but I can at least try to spell properly. And then I'm going to add a new class in here, and I'm going to call it a thumbnail generator. Like that. And my thumbnail generator is going to implement a, an interface called iHostedService. Like that. The iHosted service interface requires me to implement two methods, one called start async, one called stop async. That's it. I get cancellation tokens. 
This one is going to be called when the application starts up. This one is going to be called when the application stops. And whatever you do inside of that class is nothing that ASP.NET Core cares about. The only thing to remember is that if you don't, if you're an Azure, for example, and you're not turning on always on, it means that your application will actually be recycled and stopped. And then when the request comes in, it starts back up again. So if you want to have a hosted service that, for example, sits and, and listens to queues or, or handle uh, messages on event server buses and things like that, make sure that you turn on always on or make sure that your application is always running because the only time that this thing can run is when your web app is actually running. So the implementation of start async looks like this. Nope, it doesn't because it needs a constructor first. That looks like this. So I have a constructor. Dependency injection is fully supported. All I want to do in here is I'm going to go and uh, inject the hosting environment. I'm going to inject an interface or an uh, a repository of employees, and I'm going to store those uh, in my variables here, and I'm going to create a global variable called uh, FSW, which is a file system watcher. And then in here, I'm going to go in start async. I'm going to go and look at the images slash employees folder in the www root folder. So basically, inside my images, employees in here, it's going to look for, for uh, uh, sorry, it's going to look at that folder. And then I get that folder, I create the directory if it doesn't exist. And then I create a file system watcher saying that, hey, I want to listen to any files being added or changed inside of that path. And then I create an event listener for file created and I enable racing events and return completed task. So whenever a file is created inside that folder, the employees folder here, I'm going to get notified. And then the implementation of that looks like this. It's going to be a bit long. I'm going to walk through it, but I need to fix some stuff first. I need to add a NuGet package. So I'm going to go manage NuGet packages, and I'm going to add a NuGet package called six labors. That one, and it's going to be a six, six labors image sharp like that. Uh, and this is now scaring me because my demo is dependent on this library and I think they've updated it. That's going to cause this might cause problems for my next demo. If I have problems, remind me that it's version 2.1.3. I'll try to remember it. So I'm going to add that uh, to my project. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say the image that I've got here is going to be from Six Labors. Hello. It's going to be from. It's going to be from six labors image sharp. And that thing is going to be an extension method that's in a weird namespace like that. So what it does, it gets notified that there's a new file being added into that folder. It looks at the address if it, or name. If it contains that dash thumb, it means there's a thumbnail and I shouldn't do anything. So I just return. Otherwise, it splits the file name based on dash. It expects there to be four par parts. The first one is going to be the tenant ID. The second part is going to be the employee ID. Then based on that information, I can go and ask my for an employee with that ID. And if I don't find an employee, I return. But if I do, I go ahead and I replay, resize the image and resave the thumbnail for it. And then there's an ugly hack at the end because once in a while, it picks up the file added and executes this before the file has actually been properly saved. So I just rerun it again. But basically, it's going to resize the image to be 100 by 150 pixels. Take my hosted service. I go to my startup. We go sort of here, and we say services dot add hosted service, and we do thumbnail generator like that. There it is. Uh, and I cannot start this, but I'm going to add a, a break. Actually, sorry, there's one step. I forgot the stop async. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much, but it it does. It looks nicer. So the stop async, I just I, I remove my handler, I disable the racing of events, and I dispose my file system watcher. That's it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a put a breakpoint in here. I'm going to put a breakpoint in there. I'm going to go F5. Yeah, let's see if this this works as nice as I hope it does. Oh, 
Um, don't do this demo on a laptop, Chris, where you, what, you have no idea what images are going to happen when you press uh, select file. Let's see here. If I go in here and I go choose file, uh, okay, it didn't, didn't pop up in sort of like a weird vacation mode, Chris picture or something like that. But there's a, there's a professional picture of me and I go upload and I get in here and you can see that the file name is going to be one dash one dash John Doe because that's what I, who I'm uploading for and he's, he's employee number one in tenant number one because it's a multi-tenant system obviously I go f5 and as you can see here this is this thing ran and I came back out here and there is no profile picture the reason for this is that even though it looks very synchronous it is actually asynchronous so this thing posted the picture and while this thing was doing its work, it returned the UI to the user. And if I refresh this now, ta-da, professional picture of me. And this is being done asynchronously in the background. So if I wanted to sort of slow this down and add logs and make sure that only one image was transformed at a time and so on and so on, I can just add as many pictures in here and the, the hosted service would run in the background and slowly convert the images for me while the UI is still responsive for the person uploading the image. So that's kind of cool. Um, I, I, I kind of like these um, uh, hosted services for, for background things that we want to run. Uh, so I'm going to go and do a, a one extra demo that actually I'm not going to do that demo because it's just boring. Uh, I'm going to go to the really complex stuff. So this is where most people after my presentation generally goes and says that I have no idea what you just showed me, I don't understand. So if you don't understand what I'm showing you now, one, feel free to interrupt and ask because that's kind of why I'm here. And two, don't feel too sad because it's, it's actually quite complicated and it took me a ton of time to figure out how to do it because it's poorly documented. But I use a lot of Azure, right? And as part of Azure, when you upload an Azure web app, there is a checkbox in the Azure portal that says add application insights. And I've always been curious on how can they have a checkbox that adds application insights to my application dynamically if my application has no idea of what application insights is. And that's kind of that's where the whole thing started. I'm like, how do they do that? And I, I do believe that what I'm doing is not quite what Microsoft is doing, but also keep in mind that Microsoft can do whatever they want because they have the source code for everything and they run everything. So I have no idea how they do it, but this is what I came up with. And the first problem I have is that to be able to load application insights into a web application that doesn't know about application insights, it means that application insights, that DLL or that NuGet package has to be on the server before I even apply my application, my, because my application doesn't include that NuGet package. Um, so what I've got here is I've got some, I'm going to create something called a runtime store. And that's the way you do it. So it's kind of like a modern version of the global assembly cache from, from .NET Framework. So it allows us to package up a bunch of assemblies and put them in a specific folder, in a specific folder structure on a server. And then those, those NuGet packages or rather those assemblies can be available to any application being uploaded to that server. So by, for, if you, for example, have a, your own servers uh, and you're running on-prem, you could preload all of your NuGet packages that you use for your application onto the servers. And then when you deploy your application, you just need to deploy your code without all of the NuGet packages, making your deployment package much, much, much smaller because everything else is already on the server. Another reason for this is that you can use it for uh, Docker, for example. You could put all of your NuGet packages in a Docker image uh, that you can then use in your application so that everything is preloaded inside of the base image that you're using, and then your application only needs to bring whatever it needs on its own. And the way that we do this, if I have this runtime store project, and it is, it's a, a simple ASP.NET Core project. It, it has a program CS file, uh, but it doesn't actually do anything. I, I really don't care about the functionality of the runtime store project and what it does. All I want to have is the CS proj file, which I have here, 
And I do need a program.cs file in here to be able to compile this for the next step. So once I've got my CS proj file, I've got done a couple of things in here. So first of all, as you can see, I have a couple of um, NuGet packages referenced here. So I'm, I'm referencing bcrypt.net, I'm referencing newtonsoft.json, six labors image sharp, and here is that problem where this actually needs to be 2.1.3 uh, because that is what uh, I added uh, to my, my project because they've changed versions. And I also have this one, this NuGet package called request diagnostics, which is actually this project here. So I have this project set up where I'm going to come back to that, but this project here creates a NuGet package. And I actually reference that in here as well, request diagnostics, and I reference it using that path there. So I'm actually changing the NuGet packages to be referencing also the debug folder of my own project so that I don't need to upload it to NuGet to get my package there. But we can ignore that for now. All you need to know is that I'm creating a CS proj file that references these four NuGet packages. That's it. If I go back, if I go back, if I go out to this folder here or this PowerShell window here, close Linux like that, and I go ls, you can see that I'm, I'm in the root of this project here. And you can see my runtime store uh, folder in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run, actually, I need to build this once. If I build that, I need to have, the reason is that I actually need to have my NuGet package. So if we just look in here in bin debug, you'll see that there's a request diagnostics 1.0.0.nupcake. So that's my NuGet package that just needs to exist. Uh, so if I take my runtime store that references that NuGet package and three other ones, and I go out here and I say .NET store, which is a command that most people have never ever seen, and then type that. Yes, that's a lot of typing and I, I cheated. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, I want to create what's called a runtime store where I store assemblies for future use. And you can find what's called the manifest, basically the list of NuGet packages that I want to put into my runtime store. You can find that at this location here. So basically, I'm pointing to my CS proj file saying that, please create a runtime store with whatever packages I have referenced inside of that CS proj file. It's going to run on Windows 10 x64, and I want you to output it to this address here. So that's going to be my runtime store address. So c colon backslash demo backslash runtime dash store. And then there's a, a skip dash dash skip dash optimization parameter at the end. Don't ask me what that does, because uh, I have no clue. If you don't add it, it fails. If you add it, it works. And I have Googled it, and I've ended up in GitHub discussions, and I've had people on the team in those issues explaining that uh, it needs to be there and stop asking questions. Just add it, and it will work. And I'm just going to trust that I add it, and it works. So we run that. So what's going to happen now is that it figures out the projects to restore. It rest restores the runtime store CS proj file. It adds it to that address there. So if I go explorer dot. Uh, and we go and we look at that folder, which is uh, demo runtime store. That's where I put my, my runtime store. That's the address that I used in my uh, uh, output runtime store. Inside here, it creates this very specific folder structure saying x64.NET 5.0. And here is one folder for each one of the NuGet pack the assemblies as needed and then one folder for each one of the versions, and then a lib folder and, and a type folder or a, a TPM. And then inside there, you find the, the actual DLL. So as you can see here, it created one for bcrypt.net, one for Newtonsoft, one for my request diagnostics, one for six flavors image sharp. And one of these also needed some system runtime compiler services and system text encoding code pages. So that is now available on my machine. The cool thing, it also creates this XML file called artifact.xml. And if I take that and we open that in Visual Studio, you can see here, it basically says, hey, these are the NuGet packages that you can find inside of this runtime store. The cool thing about this XML file is that anybody who's got this XML file and who is about to deploy to a server with this runtime store in place can go ahead and tell ASP.NET Core that, hey, when you compile, 
just keep in mind that these things here is actually going to be available on the server for me already, so you don't need to include them. So if we go ahead and we go back to PowerShell and we run uh, .NET publish, and then we do F8 twice like that, you can see here, I, I'm going to do a .NET publish to publish my uh, Enterprise Employee Management Inc. application. And I'm going to publish it to C colon demo publish. Run that. That builds my project. That builds my project. That builds my project. That builds my project. There it is. Uh, and if we go back to, to my explorer here, you can see that under publish, we find my application, including all of the, the libraries that or assemblies that were needed. And if I run it going, uh, let's open up another one of these windows. CD C colon backslash demo ls cd publish ls dot net enterprise uh, dll like that it's going to go and start up and i can browse to port 5000 on my machine and you can see that it responds as it should everything is happy go lucky and there is my application cool that works uh, so far nobody is really impressed for the very simple reason that all i've done is publish my application not very impressive but if i go and remove the publish folder and i go back to powershell again and I run another .NET publish command, but this time, instead of just doing that, I'm going to go and add dash dash manifest, and then I'm going to point at my XML file. I happen to be pointing at my XML file in the runtime store location as such, but this XML file, you can put that on a common share somewhere, or you can put it into uh, GitHub or, or your Git repo or your your uh, DevOps repo or wherever you put your source code, as long as you have an XML file that tells the, the compiler what application, what assemblies are available at the runtime store. If I run this again now, passing in a manifest file, and I go to my publish folder, you can now see that there is no bcrypt.net, there is no json.net, there is no image sharp, six labels image sharp in here. And, but if I go here and I go and try to run my application again, it all, it's also going to complain. It's going to say, uh, Chris, you suck. Uh, I cannot find bigcrypt.net. Okay, fair. And the reason for that is that it says this assembly was expected to be in the local runtime store as the application was published using the following target manifest files. So as part of this, it actually says uh, to the system that I expect these assemblies that I depend on to be in a runtime store. So the way that we fix that is by going ahead and adding an environment variable on our server. So in my case, I'm going to go ahead and add an environment variable, and it's going to be .NET, and I think I can press F8, and it's going to be there. There it is. That was not what I wanted. Let's go C colon backslash uh, demo backslash runtime dash store like that. So once I set that environment variable, ASP.NET Core knows how to look at that environment variable. And if I try to run this now, ta-da, my application runs. And I can browse to it just to verify that it does work. So it works. And it's really cool because, well, my application is obviously running without those assemblies, and they're being loaded from my runtime store. It's pretty cool. Um, the next part is to dynamically get it to load uh, a NuGet package, because say we wanted to load uh, application insights. In my case, I created my own application insights called Request Diagnostics, um, and it, it's going to be this this really crap implementation of a diagnostics log that all it really does is when you log data to it, it, it adds it to an in-memory array. And when you stop it, it saves the files to a disk. And then there's another middleware in here that basically for every incoming request, it adds a, a log statement saying that somebody tried to request this thing. And if you browse to slash diagnostics, it's going to go ahead and show you whatever is in the log. So I need to dynamically load these things into my application. 
And the way that we do that is we add two classes in here. First of all, we go ahead and add a class called diagnostics, diagnos, diagnostics startup filter. Startup filter, let me try it. So diagnostics startup filter, um, and I have an implementation of that uh, to make it fast. I know I'm a little bit over time already. Sorry about that. Um, the diagnosis startup filter implements I startup filter. An I startup filter is an, a, an interface that if you add that to a, an IOC container to any ASP.NET Core application, as your application comes to the configure method in the startup class, so basically when you get to, actually that's the wrong application, doesn't matter, but let's take this one. When you get to this method here, if you have any services implementing iStartup filter inside of the IOC container, they are going to be called and you get access to the iApplication builder so that you can go ahead and add things to the request uh, pipeline. And what I'm going to add to request pipeline is my own diagnostics middleware. But how do I get it into the IOC container uh, when the application doesn't know about it? Well, that's where the other class comes in. So if we create a class called uh, hosting start up assembly like that. Actually, it's, sorry, that's the wrong name. It's supposed to be called diagnostics. Diagnostics hosting start up like that. And the implementation for it is this. So uh, uh, this is an implementation of iHosting Startup. So the iHosting Startup gets invoked much earlier. It actually gets invoked as part of what you put into your program file. So it actually gets invoked as part of this thing here. So instead of getting told, getting access to the uh, request pipeline, it actually gets hold of the web host builder, allowing me to add services to my builder. And the way that, and then in here, I actually go and add to, to services. I add my diagnostics log and I add my I start a filter that then adds things to the request pipeline. And then you have to add an assembly attribute up here saying that, hey, this is a hosting startup and here is the class that I want you to use as a hosting startup. And it, it's gonna be something that implements I hosting startup. So with those two classes in place, what I need to do is I need to update because I already have a NuGet package version 1.0.0. I'm going to have to go to this thing here and I have to change the packaging to be 1.0.1 like that. And if I rebuild this, rebuild, uh, we should now see that in my bin folder, there is a new package. There's a one called 1.0.1, like that. that, that works fine. Um, and here is where it tends to fall apart. So let's try this again. I'm gonna rebuild my store. So I'm gonna go and run a uh, .NET store command again to rebuild it. And if we go back out here, just to check my runtime store, inside x64, net five, uh, request diagnostics, there's now 1.0.1 that includes the code that I just added. So that, that should be fine. So the next funky stuff is that whenever you build an application, you actually get in the output of your application, and if we go and show all files here, you get a file called classname.depths.json. And depths.json is actually a JSON file telling the, the, the uh, runtime what assemblies should be loaded into memory for this application to work. So whenever you do .NET run runtime store.dll, the runtime looks for this depths.json file. It figures out all the dependent assemblies based on that file, and it lo loads them into memory before it runs the runtime store.dll so that when runtime store.dll gets loaded, those assemblies are already available in memory. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this runtime store depths.json, but I'm going to remove the reference to the runtime store itself, which is actually, actually that was the wrong, no, that's the right place. That's where I want to remove it, I think. Let's just see. I want to remove 
Uh, no, sorry. Ah, let, let's see. I want to remove. Sorry, that's no. Oh, yeah. uh, I want to remove all of that. So let's remove that. That's not going to work. That's one too many. Sorry. This is what I want to remove. Sorry. There it is. So I'm going to remove the reference to itself, and I'm going to remove the reference to itself down here as well, and just leave the reference to. And these are going to be all the things that is needed to be able to run request diagnostics. And that has not been updated. So sorry, I have to rebuild that. If I rebuild that, that now references 1.0.1. Once again, go back up here, remove the reference to itself so I don't load the runtime store because I don't need that. I just want to make sure that it loads up the bcrypt.net, .NET Core, JSON, and my request diagnostic package. Once I have one of those uh, rep depths.json, I can go and I can copy that. Let's do X copy. So I'm going to X copy my runtime store.depths.json into a folder called additional depths. And then it's really, really important that it goes into shared Microsoft ASP.NET Core app version 5.0.0 diagnostic.depths.json. If I run that, it's going to be a file. This is saying that any application that starts up on my machine that references ASP.NET Core app version 5.0.0 should also load the dependencies located in that depths.json folder or depths.json file. So it means that if I go, it requires a couple of NuGet er, um, environment variables. So if we go ahead and we add an environment variable, I'm going to go over here and do it. I'm going to add another environment variable, variable called .NET additional depths. That's the one. That point is, hey, there are additional dependencies that should be loaded on this machine. I set that. And then I set another one called ASP.NET Core. And it's going to be hosting startup assemblies. And I say request diagnostics. So what's going to happen now when I go and say .NET uh, Enterprise DLL. So what's going to happen when I run this now is that First of all, it's going to know about my runtime store where I have pre-built uh, NuGet packages, including my request diagnostics package. And then it's going to go and look at additional dependencies and say there are additional dependencies, dependencies documented in this folder here. And it's going to find out that my application uses that address, uh, uses that thing called ASP, Microsoft ASP.NET Core app and in version 5.0.0. Because of that, it's going to load in my depths.json file and load any assembly in that JSON file into memory as well, including my request diagnostics. And then I'm telling ASP.NET Core that, hey, there is an assembly that has an, a hosting startup, and it's called requestdiagnostics.dll. And then inside my request diagnostics DLL file, it's going to run the hostings I hosting startup to be able to add my things to the IOC container. And then when the application starts up, the IOC container has an I startup uh, assembly or I uh, startup filter, which adds stuff to the request pipeline. And if I run this, you can see here it says adding generic diagnostics to system, diagnostics available at slash diagnostics. If I browse to this website, I'm going to end up in here on my website. It's going to I'm gonna, uh, there it is. I'm gonna end up in here. You're gonna see there's nothing really in here that's interesting. But if I go in here and we go and sign in as Grace again, uh, like that, nothing really happens except if I go to slash diagnostics, that now shows me the diagnostics information from my diagnostics middleware. And if I stop my application here and I do ls, you can see that there's a diagnostics log here. So if we do cat diagnostics log like that, you can see here is a JSON representation of every single request that I've done. And as you can see from my application up here, it has no knowledge at all of my uh, request diagnostics assembly as such. So all that's needed is for me to set those uh, environment variables on the server. So if you're running your own on-prem server, if you just set those environment variables on your server and prepare a runtime store, it allows you to load up things into every single application on that server 
but for the simple reason that they are targeting ASP.NET Core 5. So that, my friends, is my final, ooh, ah, that is so impressive, Chris, uh, demonstration uh, for the night.